The reading for this morning is from Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. After Jesus had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion who had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built our synagogue. <coughs> and Jesus went with them. When he was not far off from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to Jesus, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore I did not presume to come to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these words, he marveled at the man. And turning to the crowd that followed him, I said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. <clears throat> this is an amazing story on a number of levels. There is... <clears throat> As we look through this, the first thing we see is the centurion is not a Jew. He's a Roman guard. And yet somehow, in some way, he recognizes who Jesus is. In, in, uh, <clears throat> as someone with, with unique powers. As we read through this, Jesus is amazed. It says, in fact, it says he marveled at his faith. The only other people Jesus marveled at were the unbelief of the Jews. So when Jesus marvels, that's something to uh, that's something to really take into account and to think about and to look at and to study. So we here we have Jesus marveling at the faith of the centurion. And this this episode happens in two steps. Imagine imagine Jesus comes into town. And he's always got a crowd with him, right? And so he comes in and. <clears throat> some elders of the town come up, and, and you would recognize elders right away. In any small town, you know who the elders are. You know, uh, they, these guys are kind of, um, they say he built our synagogue for us, so probably these are the guys who are kind of the elders of the synagogue, which is the town meeting place. And uh, they come to Jesus, they're probably identifiable by their robes, and by their beards, one of the things, the root words for elder is actually beard. Uh, so I guess you have to be older to have this long, uh, sort of mature kind of beard. But uh, so these guys come up, and they're clearly recognizable as, as the uh, um, Jewish elders of the town. And you can imagine Jesus wondering, well, I mean, in a human sense, wondering what they might want. And all the crowd, of course, wondering what they want. And they come up, and they ask Jesus to come and heal a servant of a centurion. The, the elders of the Jews come and ask Jesus to come and heal the servant of a Roman. And remember, these are, this is occupied territory, right? The Jews have been conquered by the Romans, and so the Roman guards have occupied Capernaum, and the Jewish leaders come to ask Jesus to heal the servant of a Roman. So this is quite amazing already. Already it's kind of, it's, it's, uh, it's a little out of the ordinary. And so Jesus says, okay, because they, they plead with him so, so completely. They say he loves our nation, and he built our synagogue. And a, a synagogue, they had them in, uh, in, in every town, basically. And it's a meeting hall where the Jews would go to have their worship services. And, um, <clears throat> and so they say this Roman built our synagogue. And so Jesus agrees to come. And, uh, and he comes along, and as he gets near the house... The Roman centurion sends more people out. This is something, by the way, that, that uh, has never been um, part of my nature. I, I'm not much of a person for a protocol. I, that's why I could never be president of the United States. That's the only reason, too. 
But I, but I, I don't think I could ever stand to walk 10 steps and then stop and then, you know, the whole, because every society has this. And then there's a bit of a protocol going on here, too, because he sends the elders, he sends his most respected people who are willing to go plead on his behalf, and then he gets close, and then the centurion sends some other people, some of his household people, to go talk to the guy and say, listen, don't even come up, to come, you don't even need to come to my house. And why is it that Jesus doesn't need to come to his house? Because healers, and there were healers, there were doctors of all sorts, there were doctors, um, <clears throat> In fact, other than the technology, it was very similar. You had people who, who claimed to be spiritual healers, all the way to people who would study disease and, uh, and um, the effects of different herbs and stuff on diseases. So it's quite likely, by the way, that, that this man, the centurion, had already gone to doctors and things, and they had not been able to heal the servant. And, <clears throat> and so they come, and when the centurion says, just say the word, and my servant will be healed. He's saying something amazing about Jesus. Because whether you're a spiritual healer uh, across the spectrum to a medical healer, the one thing you have to do is be present with the sick person, right? I mean, the, the, the spiritual person would go there and they might dance around the room and they might throw things, you know, sprinkle some sort of whatever on the person or, or lay their hands on them or whatever, but they're present in the room. The doctor, of course, would go in and they would look at the rash and, and you know, I'm getting really familiar with mucus cultures lately, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> and, and they would look at all the symptoms and they would decide what the person needed and then they would give them the herbs or, or whatever therapy they prescribed. But either way, they had to be present. So the, the, um, the centurion realizes something very unusual about Jesus. Do not, uh, don't underestimate what this means that he sends the people to go talk to Jesus and say, you don't even, listen, I know, you don't even have to come to my house. Just give the word. What does that mean if you acknowledge that someone can just give the word and at a distance they'll be healed? Somehow this centurion has come to the conclusion that this really is the son of God walking around, right? And this is something the disciples have come to sort of gradually. They're, I mean, it, the centurion kind of has more faith in the disciples, I think, because they're continually amazed, right? Jesus heals somebody, and then they're amazed, and then he tells the wind and the waves to be quiet, and they're amazed. They keep saying, who is this? Who is this? Oh my gosh, who is this? And the centurion seems to already know that this is the guy who just says it. Why? Because in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God said, right? God said, let there be, and there was. And now the centurion says what? He says, just say. Just say the word. And Jesus is like, wow. That's amazing. How did you, fi how did you figure out who I am? You know, he's like the ninja savior, and somebody actually knows who he is. And he's like, wow, amazing, amazing faith. And so we want to learn from the centurion uh, some things that, uh, that will help us in our Christian faith, in our, in our walk with our Lord. And the first thing that this story teaches us is that it is faith, not family lineage, that connects us. To Christ. It's our faith, not our family lineage that connects us to Christ. The Jews were, especially the Jewish leaders, were all about the fact they were children of Abraham. They, they had the right descendants. They were in the right tribe. Whose tribe are you in? Whose, whose father was your you know, father and all this thing? And when Jesus does these things, it, it, when Jesus does miracles, it has nothing to do with their family lineage. It has nothing to do with... Um, it, has, it, it doesn't have anything to do with uh, the fact that they are Jews. Now, now, he did say that he came to the Jews. His primary mission was to the Jewish people. But he never restricted his miracles to the Jews. You recall another instance where uh, a woman whose daughter had a demon approached Jesus and said, would you please heal my daughter? And Jesus, kind of uncharacteristically, I think, uh, but you got to try to figure out what's going on and, you know, what's Jesus trying to teach, says it's not right to give the children's bread to the dogs. 
which is uh, meaning that he came to the children of Israel. And the woman says, well, yes, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. <laughs> and again, Jesus is like, oh, wow, you kind of get it, don't you? And he's like, okay, it's done. And she goes back and her daughter's healed. And so Jesus is looking for what? He is looking for faith not family lineage. And that's the first thing we need to know. We're sitting here, it doesn't matter whether your mom or your dad or your grandfather, uh, uh, it doesn't matter what they did. For some people, their Christian identity really is wrapped up in the faith of their parents or their grandparents. You know, some people, my grandfather was a preacher or whatever, and somehow that makes me a person of faith. That's not the way we read Jesus. As we look at Jesus, what we see is it's, our Christian faith is a community thing, but there's also an individual aspect where your faith, your relationship to Jesus, is not tied to anybody else's relationship to Jesus. It's certainly not tied to your family, uh, family lineage. The next thing we learn in this is how to impress Jesus, how to get a good job from Jesus. Now, how do you get a good job in the world? You try really hard and you succeed. You have demonstrable results. You set goals with, uh, you set smart goals, right? What's smart sense? Uh, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-oriented, right? Time-based. So you achieve your smart goals and people in the world are impressed. Now, there's nothing wrong with that in our worldly system, but the problem is and this is a problem we face all the time, is taking our worldly system and applying it to our faith, to our spiritual lives. Because the way to impress Jesus is not to accomplish things. There were lots of people who accomplished lots of stuff who failed epically in impressing Jesus. In fact, they did exactly the opposite. They had, they had achieved so much that they were impressed with themselves and Jesus was depressed with them. The way to impress Jesus is to trust Jesus. That's the way to, to get it. If you want to get a combination from Jesus, it's not going to come from whatever you can put on your resume. It's going to come from trusting Jesus. The Bible even says the work of God is this, to set smart goals and achieve them for the kingdom. No. It says the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So if you, if you are looking to be commended by Jesus, this, among, along with many other accounts, teaches us that the way to, to be commended by Jesus is to trust Jesus. And sometimes that'll make sense, and sometimes it won't. Sometimes it'll seem odd. Sometimes, sometimes it'll match up perfectly with worldly systems of accomplishment. And sometimes it will be diametrically opposed to what seems like the right thing to do. But the way to get commended by our Savior is to trust our Savior. <clears throat> the third thing we notice in, in this, and, and this takes us to a place to really trust Jesus, is who this shows Jesus to be. It's the person that the centurion somehow already recognized Jesus to be. He is the creator walking on earth. He is the one who speaks and creates. And so when we say to trust Jesus is the way to get commended by Jesus, and then we want to back up and say, well, why should we trust Jesus? Because Jesus is the creator. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made through him. And, and this, is a, this, is a, this is one of the most emphasized, uh, uh, this is this, one of the sentences in the New Testament with the greatest emphasis. It says, everything was made through him, and nothing was made that was made without him. I mean, it's, it, it, it's like a forehand and a backhand. <sighs> He's the man. He's the one. He's the creator walking on earth. And so when we see this account with this centurion, what we are reminded of, among all the other teachings, among all, all the other nice things, the wonderful things, the teachings about the way to live is that the person who is teaching all these nice things, these wonderful things, these way to, this way to live, this person is the one through whom all things were made. And so when we 
talk about trusting Jesus with our lives, we're not talking about trusting a good teacher. We're not trusting about someone who has studied hard and gained worldly wisdom. We're not somebody talking about learning from somebody who has gone through the school of hard knocks. Although learning from people like that is great, what we are talking about is learning from and following the person who brought everything into existence in the first place. And the last thing is something we want to take and move beyond this uh, parable. We want to move beyond this parable to another parable. Well, uh, excuse me. <clears throat> we want to move beyond this account to another account. Because the greatest power Jesus brings is not healing our servants, healing our loved ones, healing ourselves. Because every healing Jesus brought, every healing Jesus made happen in people's lives was undone again by the brokenness of the world, by the brokenness of our bodies. Sickness and death took every person that Jesus healed eventually, unless they're hiding on the hills of Palestine somewhere, but we don't know about it. But as far as we can tell, everybody eventually died again, with, with, with even, the, even the people Jesus raised. And so the power that Jesus really brings is something even greater than that. You will recall another instance where Jesus was in a room teaching, and <clears throat> And there were some people, there were four guys who had a friend who couldn't walk. And they had to carry him around on a mat. And they heard Jesus was there. And they put him on a mat and they tried to get in. And the building was so crowded they couldn't get in. Filled with really nice people, obviously, right? Won't let a cripple in on a mat carried by four friends. <laughs> Please. But, I don't know. Kind of there. But these guys were tenacious, you remember. They went up on the roof, and they pulled the tiles off the roof, and they let the guy, the guy on the mat, they had him on ropes, and they let him down through the roof in front of Jesus. This is a story people will not forget, right? Do you remember that time? And what is the first thing Jesus says to that man? He looks at the, the, his friends who love him so much. He looks at the man on the mat, and he says... Your sins are forgiven. That's the power that Jesus really brings. Because you know all those people that healed, that, that died again? The people that Jesus uh, um, you know, raised up from the dead or healed their sickness that ended up dying again? Every one of them had to go face God with their lives. Had to go look their creator in the eye when they died. Had to go before the judgment seat. And so there's one thing that's, there's a power that's even as important as the power of physical healing would seem. There is a power that is more important, and that is the power to forgive our sin, to make us right with God. So that whether or not we get hit by a car on the way out here today, or we live a long and healthy life, when we, we know that whatever happens, when we face our Creator, we face our Creator in peace. That's the power of Jesus. And he said, and that's, and that's what he knows people need. So the first thing he said to this man was, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. And then what happens? The elders of the Jews, the, the, the religious teachers, who are the ones who never seem to be able to impress Jesus, because they're too busy trying to impress everybody else, they start grumbling. Who are your hearts? What kind of guy? He's blaspheming. How could he free of sin? What kind of man is, you know, you could picture all I always picture like the, the old bankers in, in their, like Mary Poppins. You know, they're all just, they're, I take umbrage at that, right? Umbrage. I tell you. And Jesus looks at them and he's sad. He's sad because they, they just don't get it. And then he says, which is easier? To say your sins are forgiven or to tell someone to stand up and walk. And what's the answer? The answer for the, for the religious leaders is this. Well, anybody can say your sins are forgiven. Oh, any, you know, you can, anybody in the world can walk up and say that. Who knows if it's true, right? But if you say, stand up and walk, now you're calling the question, right? You're saying, who is this? How does he have the authority? Why, why should I believe him? And so Jesus says, but so that you may know that I have the authority to forgive sins. 
that's why Jesus brought healing. It's not, these are all temporary, people got sick. The, the reason that Jesus brought healing was to demonstrate his authority to do what he really came to do, which is forgive sins. The man on the mat, he turned to the, the, the religious leaders and said, so that you would know that I have the authority on earth to forgive sins. And then he turns to the man and says, take up your mat and walk. And the man stands up and walks. And what does he walk out with? He walks out with the amazing healing, right? But more importantly, he walks out with the word of Christ that your sins are forgiven. He, works out, he walks out with the word of Christ. My friend, all is right between you and God. I know you've messed up. I know you're still going to mess up. You're broken. Boy, are you messed up. Whatever it is you want to say to yourself in the mirror. But all is right with God. Take heart. Your sins are forgiven. That's the real message of Christ. When he brings healing, he brings healing physically. And why doesn't he heal us all physically now? Because, because not everybody needs that demonstration. We have the demonstration in the scriptures. Sometimes he does heal, sometimes he doesn't. And I can't predict when. But what we have is a demonstration in healing of his real power. The power to tell us that all is right between you and God. Peace, brother. Peace, sister. When you lie down at night, don't let your heart be troubled and don't be afraid. Relax and be at peace. Because your life, no, your soul is at rest in the hands of God. And that's been, that's been our God ever since the beginning. Our verse for the week is that very thing. 1 Kings 8, verse 23. <coughs> Lord God of Israel, there's no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. You keep your agreement of love with your servants who follow you. And so this demonstration of Jesus' power points us back, draws us back to remember again the true power of the words of Jesus to our lives. Take heart. Your sins are forgiven. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you have uh, preserved for us in your word all sorts of accounts and stories. And today we have seen an account of Jesus healing someone at a distance. Father, he was headed to go into that room and the man, in great faith, told Jesus he didn't have to step in his house to say the word. Father, you have said the word to us. Your sins are forgiven. You have said the word to us. Peace be with you. Father, let us take that peace into ourselves. Let us hear those words with faith so that they fill us up with peace, enabling us to live in that peace and have your love in us so much that when we encounter situations where love is not around us, it is still inside us and we can bring your love and your peace into the lives of those around us. Father, give us faith to trust in you to make that so in Jesus' name.